thanks everyone for joining this session. Um, my name is Emmy. I work for eLife. Um, I'll explain a bit more about eLife later. But uh, I have a word of warning to start this with. Uh, this has been extremely new things for us. Um, so it's very, very exciting. I'm thrilled to be able to present this work, but you also have to understand that uh, we've literally been working to this up to the very last second with the team from New Zealand today. So everything you see is fresh, uh, it will break. So that's the whole point of me being here is to get you to tell us what's wrong, um, what's right, what you like, what you don't like, and uh, we'll work from there. So um, I will share my screen in a second, but for just for the sake of this session, how we're gonna, thinking about how we're gonna run this most effectively virtually. Uh, so uh, I'll be relying heavily on the agenda doc. So um, the, the way that I envision this going is that I talk for about five minutes and then we will entertain discussions and questions for five to 10 minutes. Um, there's also a bit of hands-on things, but you don't need software for that. You just need your browser, uh, which is also software, but let's not go there. <laughs> um, if you have any questions during the presentations, please leave them under um, each, uh, in the Q&A section under each of the respective parts. Um, if you see, you know, the questions that are similar to the one that you want to ask, just plus one to upvote the question. I'll try and answer the ones that have the most upvotes verbally and then answer everything else in text if we don't have time. Um, yeah, as I said, this is super new and the reason for presenting this is so that we could get very early feedback and also, yeah, to really have you in part of that design process of this tool stack. So, um, uh, please put your ideas, comments, feedback, anything you want to say under the feedback section uh, area of each section. Uh, plus ones will be very welcomed. Uh, it will be really helpful if you could put your name before your comments, if you, especially if you want me to follow up with you on that conversation. And yeah, in particular in that case, uh, an email address with some sort of contact details in the roll call section would be really helpful too. If you want to keep that private, uh, you can email me. My email address is on line 76. So uh, innovation at elisciences.org. Um, that's it. So we will start and I will try to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Hope you can share my screen and someone can give me a thumbs up. <laughs> awesome, thanks, sir. Um, all right. so. Yeah, enriching a research paper with code and data. This is something that we've been working on for about three years now at eLife. So uh, for those of you who don't know eLife, we are a nonprofit organization funded by the Wellcome Trust, uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, Max Planck Institute in Germany, and also with the Wallenberg Foundation in Sweden. Uh, we are probably most well known for running a fully open access online journal uh, in the life sciences, publishing some of the best works. Um, but actually, we, uh, from the very beginning, we've been trying to be innovative. And what we mean by that is really to push the boundaries of what research communication could be by working together with the community. Uh, so we have, you know, our, the success of the journal has been built on a very um, creative and supportive uh, editorial community. We have, you know, a a large part of our work is driven by early career researchers and the as a community manager my role in particular within eLife is really to support the the work from the open source community to drive forward open innovation for research communication and changing the ways that we discover share consume and evaluate research uh, so that's sort of the eLife innovation initiatives mission so we yeah, just a side note, we do actually provide funding, mentorship, and uh, promotional support for uh, community-driven open source projects in this space. Um, so the, this particular project came out of a collaboration and from, uh, with a couple of community-driven uh, research communication projects. So I'm gonna mention them as I go. But uh, yeah, the collaboration started in 2017. Um, we basically asked the question, does the paper have to be the way that it is now? Um, and one obvious gap that we realized is that, you know, while a lot of research nowadays use code and data extensively, that's never been captured in the manuscript as part of the narration. 
So our vision is something that we now call the executable research article, where the, the code and data is within the flow of manuscript. Um, we also understand that not all the users want to have all the, all the views of the code and data on first glance. You may just be trying to understand if you want to read that paper. Um, and so our focus is to understand the different types of users and consumers for that paper and to make sure that we build a set of tools and a format for the papers that would work for those individual audiences. Um, our sort of development principle is that it should be developed in a modular manner so that ho hopefully, you know, people can build on top uh, on the technology that we've developed. Uh, they should be able to use the platforms and tools that they were familiar with um, and also it should be future proof uh, so that you know it doesn't just break and it, it's not uh, um, it cannot be used in the future and finally I guess the most important thing is that we really really want to use this opportunity to explore how we can encourage the reuse of published research, be it re reuse of data, pipe, uh, data processing pipelines or the text or the graphics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this project has been a collaboration between ourselves, Substance and Stencilla. Um, in particular, Stencilla has play, played a huge role in the recent development, so I'll keep referring to them. So this is a demo that I showed last year, the collaborations workshop. We released this in February uh, last year. This is sort of a prototype of what we see happening. Uh, this is a normal looking eLife paper, if you're familiar with the journal, but even if it's not, it looks pretty normal. Except for the fact that when you go above the figures, you have this code box um, that displays the code underlying that particular figure. You can edit the code in browser. And furthermore, you can re-execute this. Um, so you see me changing some of the code here. I basically tried to change a box plot to um, to a dot plot. And sorry, that was really fast. But uh, before it was a it was a bar plot, um, and now it's a, it's in dots. So uh, that sort of, sort of shows you the idea of what what we've achieved with this, what we're trying to achieve with this prototype. Um, so we published that in February. We got people really excited about it. Um, there were people who were sort of playing around with the article like I did. And, uh, and they were, you know, screenshot, screenshotting their results and putting it on social media. Um, that allowed us to build a case to basically allow authors to publish this at scale and journals to publish these at scale. Um, and so what we needed to build were you know, tools that will allow authors to use what whatever tools they're using before, be it Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown, to be able to convert to a format that we can publish. Um, we need to be able to host these documents um, and provide a reliable and performant re reproducible execution environment so that they could be run live in browser. And then finally, we also want to make sure that these sets of tools will fit into publishers, existing publishers workflows because Ultimately, we don't want to be the only publishers doing this. We want all the publishers to be able to take these and say, look, there's a demand from the research community and we're gonna do something similar as what eLife is trying to do. And then they will be able to take these tools and adapt it for their own use. So um, this was sort of our vision. Um, I'm wondering, I'm gonna pause at this point. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment, but uh, if you have any questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask, otherwise I can move on. Mm. Emmy, yeah. was, was this the, um, the paper you released February last year, was this, um, am I remembering correctly that there was some involvement from the Binder community in this? Am I mistaken? Yes. No, you're not mistaken at all, thank you. Um, yeah, we, so the demo's backend was built, was built uh, on repo to Docker and the Binder, hub uh, infrastructure. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been sort of a, an interesting high level collaboration between Stencilla, who's building the backend for us now and uh, the Binder community. Um, but as, as I said, like we, we'd love for, um, so all the code for all of these tools that we're building are completely open. And so uh, we'd love for the binary community or, or any other interested communities to come and take that code and see how they could adapt it to fit within their, their envisioned uh, workflows for publishing. 
Um, that's how, that's how, I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. All right, so if you have any other further questions, just leave them in the agenda doc and I can answer them later as well. Uh, and let me know if I'm going too fast. So, okay. Sorry. So yeah, so as I said, uh, going back to point one here, um, the first thing we wanted to build was something that would allow researchers who are using whatever tools that they're using at the moment to be able to publish a, an executable article like the one that I showed. So um, Stencilla sort of looked at this problem and I really put a lot of work into identifying what needs to be done and I think they've done a fabulous job. So I'm trying, I'm going to try and do them just this year. <laughs> um, so uh, there we've we had we had a lot of conversations with researchers to understand sort of what the pain points are in terms of converting between different uh, tools and formats that they use to write the paper. So a common one that we've heard is, you know, I use Jupyter Notebook to do all my data analysis, but my PI used Microsoft Word to correct my manuscripts. And basically, if anyone's tried to do that before, it's a pain because once you once you convert a Jupyter notebook into a Microsoft Word document, you flatten everything and you lose the identity of the chunks of code. So you can't really, so let's say your PI has done a bunch of amendments on the Microsoft Word doc, you have to manually feed them back into the Jupyter notebook. Um, and that's a pain. And the, the other pain point is between sort of research, researchers and journal handoff. So that's something that as a when I was a researcher, I did not understand at all. Like, why is it so difficult to publish articles, right? And that's because actually research articles are actually um, stored in an XML format. So it's all structured data. Um, I should have had an example to show you how this works, but basically all the article title, authors, uh, author affiliation, um, citations, links in their sources are all tagged in a specific way. Um, and that allows interoperability with other research infrastructures like, you know, Crossref event, for example, to count how many times your paper has been cited. It allows Google to search for your paper. Um, so having that structure and being consistent um, and stand, standard with it is really important for discoverability of your paper. And so actually journals spent a lot of effort when you submit that manuscript in a PDF format, journal actually spent a lot of effort trying to make sure that that goes into the XML correctly. Um, and that's incredible for me. <laughs> and so is there a way to, while we're building these tools to convert between different formats, is there a way to actually convert into a format that journals can use directly? So the ideal workflow would be that, you know, you write in your Jupyter notebook, you can submit to the journal and the journal will use this tool to convert that into some XML that makes sense. Um, so some of Stencilla's work has been this tool called Encoder. It's basically their version of a conversion tool. So um, you may ask, why do we need a new conversion tool? We already have Pandoc. For those of you who are familiar with Pandoc, it's another open source conversion tool between various formats. Um, the reason because, is because Stencilla really took care of trying to make sure that everything is encoded properly and, and tagged properly. So if you have experiences with Pandoc, again, if you convert from Jupyter to docx, you lose the identity of the code chunk. Whereas with Stencilla, they uh, developed this pretty smart way of trying to get around this. So this is something that they call a reproducible PNG. So the output of the code chunk, be it a table or, or, or a graph, uh, becomes a graphic file on, on the docx when you convert it. But then the code of that is actually encoded in the metadata of that PNG file. And so when you back convert from this Microsoft doc, to a Jupyter notebook that's immediately recognized during the conversion process and can then be converted back into a code chunk um, in Jupyter. And so you don't lose that identity information. Um, and there are more, there, there, there are um, sort of, they've, they've expanded this idea and used it to facilitate a really what we call looseless, uh, lossless conversion between different types of, of research uh, article formats. So, 
uh, this now results in something called Stencilla Open, and I'd love for you to uh, try uh, have a play around with it yourself. But I'm going to show you more or less how um, it could be used. So this is just a demo of the of the conversions. Um, it's not it's not it's not the actual tool that we envision researchers to be using. So I'm going to use one of the example files that they have here. So uh, let's use this. Uh, where's the Jupyter, Jupyter notebook here? So sorry, that went way too fast. Um, I'm going to look at that link address and try and give you a view of the original uh, Jupyter notebook, which is hosted, hosted on GitHub. So this is the original Jupyter notebook. You can see code chunks, the output. So this is that and opened on Stencilla. Um, you can see that all the title aspects of it is preserved, all the links are preserved, the code chunks are preserved. Um, and this is an HTML rendering of the Jupyter notebook, right? So, I mean, you can already do that in browser, but this, is, this allows flexibility in styling as well. And I'll show you that in a second. So, so yeah, so all of this, all of this looks quite good. Um, they've developed theme on the site, which allows you to customize the sort of uh, theming uh, CSS styling aspect of it. So you can convert it to an eLifestyle article, for example, and that gives you the eLife type um, styling nature. Um, so, so that's sort of showing the flexibility of this system. And you can also inspect this, the metadata uh, structure behind this. So, um, just loading here. Give it a second. Yeah, so all of this, all of these titles and everything is annotated in what we call JATS XML, which is an XML format that's used by us in other journals. Um, and so it would have things like title, authors, subtitles, tables, for example. Um, but we've actually, because we've not really published anything like code chunks. Um, it's actually something that they had to get around is to uh, basically build a new schema for things like code. So uh, here I'm showing the XML behind that, that HTML page that you just saw. Um, and so you can see how, you know, the names, for example, name, given name, family name, and then um, links, code cells, um, and then there is Stencilla code chunk. So this is the chunk of code that you saw in here. So that's Stencilla's um, schema that they defined for, for code chunks that are specified. And so that allows for the conversion between the different formats. So um, that's I'm going to pause here as well. And there is the URL up here on the screen that you can go to and play around with some of the examples there. I'll give you about five minutes to sort of just look at the styling and um, play around with the different articles and examples that we've supplied. Um, and I'd love to know what you think. Again, it's a bit buggy, so bear with us. <laughs> but. Um, I'd love to know what you think and what we should do. Let me know if you can't get to the link and if you don't know where to click. So I'm going to stop sharing for a sec because I lost my chat box. But the link is also on the agenda doc on line 110. Neil also put it in the chat box. Ah, oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I just saw.
Yeah, so a really cool question in the Q&A section. Thanks for the emoji. <laughs> yeah, it's very complicated. I love an answer as well. Um, it's just, I think it's, it's our solution at the moment for marrying between existing systems and uh, future systems. So I guess what the amazing thing that Stencilla has built is a way to be able to convert between all of this and I mean, the only way I see it changing completely away. So, so basically, Encoder is all about switching from one structured data format to another structured data format. And it doesn't really matter which ones you choose between, right? It's all about preserving that information and making sure that it can consistently appear if you change, um, if you convert, do multiple conversions specifically, uh, especially. Um, yeah, so unless we're completely moving off structured data for research articles and information, um, I think Encoder is pretty future proofed. Um, and in terms of JAS XML and how long we will be keeping it, yeah, I, I can't answer that question because. <laughs> Because I'm not a part of production, the production team. I think as long as like in all all of the, I can say that all of the tools that are currently built in eLife are working off JAS XML, and so. I guess the answer is as long as we have trust in publishers, right? And because because the publishers, uh, they are probably uh, making money off of their business, they don't want to change their business and their business is built on XML. Yeah, you can say that, but also, but also, you know, with all the, with all the information on the web, right? Like all of it is semantically tagged. So my question is, uh, like, I guess my interpretation of your question is, are we going to move off that at some point? Um, and I so far don't see it happening. Um, does that, makes yeah. sense <laughs> I, I, that makes total sense um I, I think i can see that at some point you will have multiple uh technologies so you, you, you maybe in 10 years time or whatever you'll call it a legacy technology yeah hopefully i mean i i, I hope it will be like yeah. i i mean personally the amount of time we spend putting pdfs into xml can really be better spent and it's very manual as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, so if we can move off structured data without losing any aspect of that discoverability or, or the ability to extract knowledge or, or index anything, then I'm all in favor of, of you know, using text matching or whatever that works, right? Um, yeah. Love to see new ideas in this space. Yeah, I, th I think for publishers, they will only move off XML if there is a new, a new format that can do something that they can currently not do. Or maybe alternatively does exactly what they're able to do now, but cheaper. Yeah, I think, I don't know what the motivation for us to move off XML is. I guess, yeah, if, if we can save, like, yeah, so, so the, the manpower behind converting things to XML and making sure that is consistent is huge. And so there, there's a cost there, right? And so if we can actually get rid of that, so our current idea is actually to build an editor that writes XML. So folks, instead of using whatever that is not XML, like why don't we just write articles in XML? Um, so that's the other, that's the way that we're going around it. But you know, if we can forget about XML altogether, that would be great. Um, I, I'm kind of kind of like sort of speak up and say, I, I like JATS XML as a publishing format because it's so much easier for me to work with than HTML or PDFs. Um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if ultimately in 10 years time it would be the right one, but I would be sad to lose a lot of the things that JATS XML gives me over and above other alternative publishing formats that are, are in use today. So. Yeah, thanks for that. I think. I mean, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure there could be better ones, but uh, at least it's a, at least it's a standard that I can read and I can, um, I can look at, and it's still undergoing some development. 
yeah and it's an, it's an open format as well so theoretically everyone is open like can can contribute to it um and feedback on it uh, i'm going to answer that second question on numbers about conversion accuracy the answer is not at the moment because we are basically still trying to resolve a lot of bugs I and mean, we're working super hard on this and it's not easy as you can imagine all these different file formats and and the the amount of different types of research artifacts as well and so um stencilla's made a huge step towards that being even possible and then now we're we're basically chucking as many different types of articles and research manuscripts into it to iron out all the bugs <laughs> thank you for that feedback um i'll let the team know they'll really appreciate it all right i'm gonna move on to the next bit um going to start screen sharing. So yeah, um, please feel free to play around with it and try and break it and let us know. I think that's our, that's our approach at the moment. Um, uh, okay, so I'm assuming everyone can see my screen again. Um, yeah, so so we i talked about how we can convert between different types of research tools that we what we think researchers use at the moment um the idea here being you know that authors can use whatever they used to use and then still be able to submit an executable research article um and what so what do we think the next step is to for us as a journal to think about how we're going to get authors to submit to us and what are the steps that needs to take place for for both us and for for the authors um so as a very very first step this is what we're planning <laughs> so we're opening up this opportunity for the first phase to authors who have already published with us um there's a couple of reasons uh, if anyone is interested i can elaborate on that later but we're definitely thinking to roll it out to everyone from from the very beginning so um yeah so assuming that you've published with elife um you would use your article your the url to your elife article as a starting point um and you will be able to open a new stencilla hub project using that url so this looks really simple and i'll show you a bit of that later so um you can you can add your data basically the idea is if you submit a normal article with us you'll have your figures right so what we need is for you to add your code back on top of the of that of that figure um and there, there are sort of two ways that we're thinking to start with for to allow authors to be able to do this and so you add your 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 code back into your article um and then you save that project and then send the url to us and then we'll deal with the rest and publish it so this is the super simplistic view of how we think it's going to work uh for now um so i will show you um one so there's a branch here in step four um i'll show you the first one uh sort of a, at the wireframe of the first one and then i'll show you the second one so so yeah so we because with elife in particular we have a large community of life science researchers who may or may not be familiar with formats like jupyter or r that there's distribution right there's like people who don't code much and then there's like people who know how to use the best practices and the tools in in the in the research uh, field so we wanted to build something that would work for google docs um and this is what stencilers came up with sorry this was a recorded demo so it's annoying. there's like camera things there but uh but yeah so basically uh stencilers developed a plug-in um that you can install on gdoc and that will allow you to basically put the code here and then you can preview it and then you can drag it into the doc as simple as that so uh let me go back to showing the entire workflow workflow from the beginning so remembering that whoops sorry that was the wrong click <laughs> remembering that the the uh, six step uh workflow 
sorry, just going back to the slide. Yeah, so this is the this is the the workflow. Um, let me just go to Stencilla Hub. So if you if you go to Stencilla Hub, which you can get an account on, uh, so you sign up for a new account. This is when you when you enter a new account. This is what you see. So what you would do is, for example, I have an eLife paper here. This is actually the one that we used for the demo before, but it doesn't matter. It's a normal eLife article with no reproducible figures. So let's say I'm in this paper and I want to make, sorry, this figure one B reproducible, right? So I, I, I need the code behind that. I need the data behind that. That's, that's the prerequisite. So this is my URL. I'm just gonna copy that. And then on Stencil Hub, I can click this link button, go to link a URL, paste that link, and then now it's linked. So then, um, I can save this in some other format. Let's say I code in R. So all of my code files are in R Markdown or just R scripts in general. And so I'd like to convert to, to an R Markdown file. You can rename this whatever you want. So saving. Okay, so now it should be somewhere in my R, um, in my local environment. Um, so, the next thing I need is the data and the code. So luckily for this particular paper, actually, uh, sorry, I have the, the authors uploaded the uh, data for the graph and the, the code, the R code for it in uh, OSF server. So I can just use that. But if you are the author yourself, then you, you should have access to those things. Um, and so I'm gonna go into my R studio and open that file that we just downloaded should be this one. So here it is. Um, again, you can really see that power of that conversion. The, the title is perfectly preserved and the date accepted and everything. Um, affiliations, address, funders, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just loads of metadata. Um, and then so what I want to do is to find that chunk of code that I need to put in. So I've actually previously done this already. Um, so imagine that this didn't exist. <laughs> so this was the bit that I would have found. And then I would have put in a code chunk by clicking here, insert our code chunk. And then that was my code that a company figured 1B that I want to make reproducible. So I just copy the whole thing and then paste it here. So this was the code that was under that graph. And then now I can just save. And then I can go back to my Stencilla Hub. Where is it? Ah, it's here. And then we upload that. File upload. This one. Okay. So now it's just been updated a second ago. And what I can do is to preview it here. So try and see. Sorry, my screen's blocking myself. The preview button. Um, this is the HTML preview. Sorry, I should have regenerated that because I think I didn't post it when I tried. So I'll do it again just to show that it's actually happening. Oops. And then something doesn't work. She didn't have Huh, interesting. This is the problem when you give a live demo and you're so confident that you close your previous version. <laughs> the demo effect, I think we've all been there. Yeah, especially it's the first time that you've done this. So let's see if I can save this as an HTML and whether or not that's gonna help. Uh, okay, so there's some, you can see that encoder is definitely breaking. I'm suspecting that it's something that we just fixed actually, because I was doing this literally an hour ago and it had no problem. So you're going to take my word on it, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, yeah, so 
ideally, if this has gone well, I would have been able to show you the metadata behind it and how the code chunks are actually preserved, but I might actually try uploading that again while you ask me all the questions possible. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sorry that that demo didn't go as well as I hoped it had. Um, yeah, so ideally, once we've ironed all this out, we'd be able to, um, what you can do is you go to sharing over here and then you can add, for example, an editor of eLife and then um, be able to give them access to this whole uh, stack of things. Oh, I haven't uploaded the data file that might bring the problem. Um, but yeah, but they will be able to access the, the whole folder and then be able to use that to publish the executable version of your article. So the, as I showed already, very realistically, we have quite a way to go, but we're working towards it. And I hope that, you know, you're ex as excited as I am about this um, working in the near future. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, if you want to stay updated on the project, I strongly recommend signing up to website.org slash error updates. Um, these are bi-monthly updates. So just, you know, to be there when we announce this um, in the near future. And this project has really been a collaboration between a lot of people. Um, and one particular one that I was very thrilled to see was uh, how um, a product from the, actually the Elive Innovation Sprint in 2018 has drove our demo and a lot of the development forward. Um, and so if you'd like to work on a project like that, or you have your own idea, I strongly recommend that you join us at the upcoming sprint in September. Um, this is the link to go to if you're interested. Um, Stencil is on stencil.la. And um, yeah, emails, Twitter, just reach out to us if you want to let us know your ideas. That's fantastic, Emmy. Um, I feel as if you've kind of shown us the future. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the Google Doc. I don't know if you can see them or if you want me to, want me to read them out. I do, I can see them. Yeah. Um, let me just try and digest them for a minute. Folks keep putting questions, um, I'd be very grateful. Uh, Presumably, it's not just figures that can be reproducible, modifiable, and executable. Definitely. Um, statistical models, I'd love an elaboration on that from whoever asked that question. So, so that was me, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so very often I read papers where I think, you know, I'd like to modify aspects of the model that was used to analyze the data. And I was wondering, is that possible? I'm, I'm assuming it is if, you, if it's kind of binder under the hood or repo to Docker under the hood. Yeah, so so it's possible uh, because so yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time on the back end because most of our focus has been on the front. But uh, this is all a gateway. So the code chunks are all you know leading are all facilitated by Docker's and images uh, containers and images at the back end. So um, it's all supposed to be reproducible um, and on the uh, re, re executable on the fly. And so if your model is in the code then you can modify the code and you can see the visual results from that modification. I don't know if that's sort of addressing your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's going to be a game changer for some, for some disciplines, it really is. Because people are going to be able to see uh, how results change as a function of minor modifications in the models. So that, that's fantastic. Thanks, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, that's so, so it's great to hear that because we are also trying to just figure out, you know, what does this add really? You know, the ability to be able to re-execute life on, in browser and um, be able to modify code in browser, like how would that help researchers reuse anything? Um, and so we've kind of had an existentialist crisis and decided that it's still okay <laughs> about this. Um, and so, We've definitely provided a way for people to be able to interrogate the data and the models a bit more without installing anything on their end but we also are very cautious about providing ways for people to just download the entire um, uh, folder 
so that they could play around with it if they need to change something you know a machine learning algorithm that's going to take eight days and a lot of compute it's better if they you know um, download it or if you just want to reuse the same data workflow for your own data it, there's no way currently to really upload your own data to the article but rather you'd have to download the whole thing and then you you would insert your data and reuse it that way so yeah it, we're, we're a bit Okay, I can't say we. I personally am a bit puzzled by this as well, and so I'd love to hear folks' thoughts and what what you want to see. Um, what can what can we change here with what we've built? Uh, the second question: Does such workflow for a reproducible figure scale for technical papers containing multiple algorithms and respective implementation? Um, that's a really good question. We love it to scale. Um, please let us know if you, if that's like number one priority for you is to be able to run heavy algorithms on in browser. Um, we've currently we've currently constrained it to sort of tabular data types, so CSV, TSV, Excel files, um, because you know that's typically what I like. This is us and a couple of researchers that we've talked to who've told us, you know, most people use Jupyter Notebooks or R Markdown for that process. We see that there's a distinction between the more heavy data processing pipelines and the, um, the data visualization and analysis part of it. And there seems to be different tooling involved in the two steps. Um, so I personally don't see this at the moment being used for super heavy stuff like you, you won't train a machine learning algorithm in browser because it's just not something that there is a strong argument for doing. Um, please tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> and please tell me if I did not answer that question at all. Uh, and then that ties into the third question. So I guess I, I answered that. Um, I mean, yeah, theoretically, you can spin, you can, you can run very heavy algorithms on it. We may put a cap on it at some point because of cost, because of, you know, speeds and things, but at the moment, not really. <laughs> um, but we just don't like, I, I don't know, like, yeah, please tell me if I'm wrong. I just don't really see a use case of running all this stuff in browser. I feel like folks who run big algorithms would like to have it downloaded and use their own big data sets and, have their own back end to it maybe as well so so i don't know i could be wrong um yeah <laughs> if i if i if i may add on this um so we not only like algorithms for you know for machine learning algorithms that are heavy to to run in browser mm -hmm. what i actually told was there are um, algorithms, for example, uh, optimization techniques that are built. They are, they are really few lines of algorithms that we get in papers, but they need to be efficiently be implemented in order to produce the very last result that we see in papers, like figures for um, CPU times or something like that. But in order to reproduce such papers that it's not just to run heavy experiments or, or, or complicated workflows, but it is to have these really smaller pieces of course that are nicely written and need to be there right above, you know, those concepts in the paper. Can we really make sure that this is the case in this workflow? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Thank you. I, it, we, I think we, we need to, so what we're, what we're planning to do at the moment, because this is going to be sort of a first launch. Um, there's a lot of like I won't, I won't, I don't want to say issues, but there's a lot of uh, hurdles that we need to cross in terms of getting people actually to do this. Um, and hopefully, when we get more people to use it and break it and tell us, you know, hey, I want to do this, but at the moment it's not possible. Can you do something about it? And then we can go and say, you know, we'd love to work with you to figure out you know how the user experience should be when it comes to doing that so in short um i will keep that in mind thank you and uh we will see sort of what the community really wants to see in this to 
be able to use that feedback to prioritize what we need to do next, um, most need to do next. Um, and if you have, you know, if you're working on a project that could potentially solve that last mile problem and integrate with this tool stack that we're building. So this is all open source way. So you can look at our, tool, our, our code and see, um, you know, how this can be potentially done. Um, and if you have that idea, please do email me and I'd love to see how we can work together. Um, but yeah, but basically, like personally, the most worried that I am at the moment is still about the fact that nobody wants to do this. So as a reader, you think it's really cool that you can play around with code and things, but as an author, like what are my motivations to publish a compliment to my already published article? that doesn't give me an extra DOI and currently doesn't give me any extra research funding, right? So <laughs> um, uh, I think my current answer is, you know, if you all are here and you think this is really exciting, please spread the word about it so that we can get more people excited and being able and be willing to spend that extra hour or two to work through with, uh, with us um, and to publish these articles that people can, can play around with and to get more out of. I think getting the PhD community on board could be absolutely key here because I can imagine a number of PhD students who I work with who would just love to get involved in something like this, you know, because they've got maybe more time and inclination to, to do something differently. You know, they really want to create, create a sort of better way in which we do science. Mm. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's in line with what I think as well. And we, we are working really hard. So we are looking at launching probably next month now is april yeah so next month in may um we're definitely you know um working a lot with the early career researchers community that elife already built and trying to you know get them to spend that extra time and to help them so so yeah so my value proposition for anyone who wants to do this is you get to really contribute to building this um from the very beginning as you see super buggy help us to make something that works for you. And we'd be happy to, you know, you'd be a poster child for this tool. We'll put a lot of social power, um, like social energy behind promoting your research. So, so if you, you know, if you know someone who's published with Eli, please let me, please let them know so that they can come to me and say, hey, I really want a an executable compliment to my paper. And uh, I'd love to work with folks who are interested to get this going. Okay, thanks very much. I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. So I think we're basically a minute or so to go. So I think maybe we could draw it to a close at this point and ask there any other burning questions that people have. Um, if anybody thinks of anything after the fact, please feel free to add them to the Google Doc. I'm sure Emmy will be able to uh, take those up. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrew and uh, Neil for chairing this. And thank you everyone for being here. Again, my email address is on the agenda doc. So if you have any ideas, I'll keep checking this doc as well. But if you have anything that you want to say or tell us, just email me. Always open to that. Fantastic. Virtual round of applause for Emmy. That was fantastic. Thank you.